everyone, and welcome to one of the talks in the Unlocking Research series um, that we, that's been uh, published by Routledge in collaboration with the University of Cambridge Primary School. Um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, the Vice Chancellor Stephen Toop, who's um, of, of Cambridge University, also Graham Virgo, Senior Pro Vice Chancellor um, for Education at the University, um, and Dr. Emily Shukbra, who um, is a director of Cambridge Era and ha happens to be a parent. Um, of one of our wonderful children at our school. Um, the first uh, in, our in our series of books was called um, Un uh, Inspiring Primary Curriculum Design and Stephen uh, very kindly wrote an afterword. And I thought before we begin um, with some of the questions that I've had um, in my mind, um, one of the quotes that, that, Stephen, uh, that, that Stephen wrote was, was this, even as we speak to prepare students for the future worlds of work, relationships and leisure, the truth is that we, may, we don't need know what the challenges may be. Technological, environmental, human may emerge 10, 20 or 50 years from now. It was almost um, had a, a prophecy uh, to this because having published the book, we are now in, in a position of uh, managing the complexities of a, of a, a pandemic. So uh, the first question to, to Stephen, if I, if I may, um, what do you see as the biggest challenges for curriculum design across the globe? Well, thanks, James, and it's great to be with all of you. I, maybe I should start, though, by saying that uh, James pointed to a prophecy, but actually another part of, uh, of that afterward uh, also talks about how uh, there was a sense at uh, the time I was writing it that we'd actually managed to do a pretty good job in dealing with infectious disease, and that now we had to focus on chronic disease. Well, there totally wrong and I think that just shows how difficult it is uh, to uh, prognosticate in this time of really deep uncertainty a and I think that is the fundamental point that I want to make in relation to curriculum that we obviously are moving away from an understanding of curriculum which is based entirely in uh, facts and accumulating knowledge to one where we're really trying to focus on helping students in a sense process their lived experience. Uh, and it's, it's not, of course, to denigrate the acquisition of knowledge that's important, but it's only a base. And so much of what I think we have to be trying to accomplish in curriculum design now is helping students navigate what is such an uncertain world and a complex world uh, that then requires us to be able to uh, assess information, filter information, share information more effectively. And, and all of that, of course, also has to do with relationships, not just uh, what happens inside you, but what happens amongst people. And then finally, and this is something I know that's very, very much at the heart of what's happening at the Cambridge University Primary School, is helping to develop uh, what I think you often call compassionate citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do think that that's fundamentally important in curriculum today. And of course, that implies an openness uh, to greater diversity, which is both a reality of our world and a need uh, to understand and, and help to shape for the future. And then that notion of uh, compassionate citizenship, I think also really calls upon us uh, to be open spirited, not just to try to understand diversity, but to be genuinely open to the complexity that diversity brings to all of our society. So all of that to say, it's a pretty uh, tall order for uh, any curriculum, but it seems to me that's the world we live in. It's interesting, you also mentioned in, in your afterword that the interconnectivity of the, of the World Wide Web, and yet the experience in the last six months is that we've been disconnected in many ways um, from the relationship making that is, that, 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 uh, that is necessary when people can actually physically come together. Um, Emily, I don't know if this resonated with your experience of the last few months, but there's anything uh, about the, the children's, the real need for children to be back together with a human content, not to be mediated with a, with a screen. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it was, as you said, I've got actually two, two daughters at the, at the school and uh, it was very clear that um, the thing that probably they missed most was the interaction with their friends. That was one of the most difficult things. We are human beings um, after all. But I think, I mean, if there's one key thing that I think we've all um, learned, whatever, part of society we're, we're involved with is the critical need for, for resilience 
Um, you know, we've got this particular crisis that we've been working through over the past few months, but as Stephen rightly points out, you know, for sure, there are going to be other unpredictable, currently unpredictable crises that we're similarly going to have to respond to over the coming years and preparing our young people to be able to embrace the challenges that are associated with those and, and, and to seek a positive outcome through that and to, to be resilient, um, but to be resilient in a very positive way, I think is, is going to be you know, it, it critical whatever the world throws at us. Um, so we know that, you know, we're, we're facing growing social inequalities. We know that um, we're facing all sorts of challenges in terms of uh, destruction of nature or climate change, which is my own area that I'm particularly interested in, but also other pressures in terms of um, you know, change, changing the way that, that, that we're living society and, and the world of work in terms of greater digitization or, 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 or more, more um, autonomization of different um, future uh, jobs. And so all these different challenges are going to be ones that we need to prepare our young people for responding to. But we, we actually, there's, been, there's a tension, isn't there? Thank you, I mean, there's a tension between the, the kind of the norm or the structures of systems um, and this, this real need to start being um, more fluid and forward thinking about um, what children might be needing, knowing that Stephen said in, 50, in 20 years we may not know what they need, let alone um, um, in, in 50. But, you know, Graham, we, we saw over the summer significant challenges and tensions um, in the education system with the, the, the A-level, uh, the challenges of releasing A-levels, um, and so that tension seems for, for educators on, in, on the ground seemed to be creaking slightly. So given the tensions where the, the individual loses their agency uh, um, and the system takes primacy, uh, how, do you, how do you see the system could, inv could evolve to be more humane and person-centered? I think we've certainly seen uh, over the last few weeks with with the A-level results and GCSE results, um, complicated situation. Uh, I would certainly say it lacked humanity. Um, what we saw there was uh, grades for exams being assessed by reference to an algorithm. I mean, you could not be further away from um, a student-centered approach. But what I also saw, um, and, and I've spoken to quite a few students who've gone through that period, was that the, they certainly missed being at school, but they also missed the opportunity to prove themselves what they had learnt and what they can do with that learning. I think that that is something that goes, I mean, schools and universities focus on that all the time, but we have lost that recently. And going back to ensure that those students and, and through primary school at university, I don't think there are significant differences in our in our approach to, to the education endeavor, giving them the opportunity to prove what they have achieved and what they are capable of doing is crucial. Uh, and I hope that we will return to that and, and reinforce that over the next period. I mean, maybe I can add something because I think that, 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 that what happened over the summer in terms of A-level results is um, uh, in microcosm what can happen in many, many circumstances when a rapid policy response is required. And, and, and what, what, what happened was there was a disconnect between looking at just from a pure statistical perspective, although the statisticians would probably say that even the statistical algorithm wasn't quite what it might have been, but looking at from a, from a very technical perspective versus looking at, if you like, the lived experience. I mean, we, we, you know, where there were challenges, it was where it was, there was manifest unfairness at an individual level and and, and, and I think where there's a lesson that can be learned much more broadly is that in those situations when a rapid policy response is required, it is critical to ensure that a diversity of different viewpoints are brought into that decision making process in a really integrated way. It comes back to some of our earlier comments about the, the importance of, of, of integrated um, analysis and systems thinking around these things, but it's also integrating different viewpoints. And I think if that, you know, if there's one key lesson, it's probably that. And I think, I think yeah, James, yeah. just a, a brief comment to say that 
despite the fact that it, at one level, this was just emblematic of everything that's wrong about sort of a, autonomous decision-making, if I may put it that way, the response has actually been extraordinary. I and mean, people have leapt in, they've actually demolished that system and imposed a, a, a new response. And uh, of course, that meant that universities and others had to step in and, and change the way they were uh, thinking about the next uh, year. But most of the students will in fact be accommodated uh, this year uh, across the sector. That took an enormous amount of just human empathy, frankly, to make that happen. So I, I wanna conclude on a slightly positive note that uh, people did leap in and, and uh, in a sense auto-correct. Yeah, and for, you know, for us, uh, my colleagues in, in secondary schools, they're saying they, they just wished that um, governments and officials spoke to, you know, consulted the head teachers and the senior leaders in their schools because they know they know much more about the, the children in their in their in their midst and um, know know the children's uh, capabilities um, much more than an algorithm. So I'm really curious how this unlocking research series could actually support new new thinking for educators as part of the you know the work of the Charter College of Teaching for example in 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 gaining a greater status that teachers are not mistrusted or seem yeah. to be dumbing down um, but actually you know when, when, but actually empowered to make right decisions for their children and obviously there's as Cambridge assessment and colleagues we work with in Cambridge assessment have said you know marking papers is notoriously complex because it is, it, is not, it is not easy to say what a, what a grade is. But there's also lots of evidence that if you can teach teachers how to do it better, we'd be able to respond to the challenges, as Emily said, and, and when the crisis happens again, we can actually help with the policy change um, more swiftly and, and more humanely, I think. Um, Emily, you are um, a, um, a valued member of our uh, parent and school community, as well as um, a colleague as part of the Cambridge Zero work that we're engaging with as a school. Um, how do you see um, primary schools, especially in creating sustainable uh, futures? What needs to happen? What do we need to learn from people like you to make our curriculum more sustainable? <laughs> um, I mean, I think that the absolute key thing um, is to help instill in, in everyone, but from, right from the young primary age, a sense of agency. It's about, it's about pr providing the children with um, the tools that they will need to help shape the world that they want as their future. And, and that means, you know, and, and as part of that, obviously one has to understand better the natural world and the, con you know, the context of the sort of um, threats that we're exposed to as I was outlining a, a minute ago. Um, but I think the thing that's absolutely critical is, is not that that's just threats that are being imposed upon people, it's about providing people with the tools to be able to understand how they can respond and shape um, the world in a better way. Um, yeah. so, so if there's one key element, oh, that's the one that I would highlight. Thank you. Graham, do you have any, any thoughts, as, as one of our governors, um, the kind of sustainability of, of, of our work as primary educators? Well, I, I, I agree completely with what Emily was saying about agency, and you see that certainly as um, regards um, students at university, but also at the primary school as well. And I've had some really interesting discussions with the children at the primary school about climate and the future and these really big picture uh, issues. And they are, they're able to articulate their role in thinking through and contributing to the future. And I think we've also seen that with the response to COVID as well, actually. So this big thing that's happening around them um, but giving them the agency, but going back to what Emily said earlier about the resilience to be able to respond to that is incredibly important. And, and I would put that under the broad heading of, of, of a sustainable education. Stephen, do you have any, any further comments? Uh, no, I, I really agree with both of those comments. And I, I guess I would just invert it to say that it, it, creating a sense of hopelessness uh, is never useful uh, socially, it seems to me. Uh, you're just convincing people that everything is a disaster uh, strikes me as being a, a really unhelpful way of trying to uh, help 
develop that sense of resilience because it's all too easy then to, to simply say, well, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. It's just, uh, it's too big for me. And I think, especially I, I imagine at, at the primary level, getting concepts into what you might call bite-sized pieces so that it becomes possible to reason your way through towards action uh, strikes me as really important. Thank you. So just, to, just as a final, um, a final uh, kind of test to the academics in the, in the room, uh, what needs to, uh, uh, Stephen, by Shansa, what needs to uh, change and what needs to stay the same? Well, I, I'm always very reluctant to tell people who are probably more expert in their field than, than I am uh, what my approach on this is. But if, if I think about curriculum in a, a primary education, I would, I would imagine that what needs to sit, stay the same is, at least what I've seen at the Cambridge University private, uh, primary school, is a sense of community. I hope that uh, holding on to that uh, enveloping feeling of being part of something bigger than oneself uh, strikes me as essential. And, it, and I think it goes both to uh, the resilience uh, that Emily talked about and to a sense of uh, responsibility because it is the sense of being in the community that helps you derive a sense of, uh, of compassionate citizenship. So I, I think that I hope stays the same. I think probably what I would say might have to change is um, perhaps really integrating more thoroughly the evolving world of online into a contemporary education. Uh, I've, I happen to have been working on a project myself on artificial intelligence, oddly enough, recently. And, and I am so struck by the dramatic changes that we are inevitably going to see, experience, feel. And I, I sense that we're all a little bit behind on that uh, uh, socially. Uh, and I, I'm not a question of blame. I think universities are also behind on this. So I think that's an area where I would really wish to see a lot of creative thinking. How is it that we further help our students understand a world that they're part of and are going to be really deeply implicated in, in a way that, you know, when I was growing up, we just weren't. And, and Graham, as, as a governor of our school, um, you know in much more detail the work that goes on here, but broadly for primary schools across the, across the country or indeed the globe, what, what needs to stay and what needs to change? Well, I think in, in terms of what needs to change, and I know this is being considered at primary school, the university primary school and, and more widely, is exactly as Stephen said, that the, the, the rapidly developing world and ensuring that the children who are educated are prepared for that. But there shouldn't be change for change's sake. And I think sometimes, particularly when curricula is, is looked at, there's, there's a sense, oh, we, we need to change something. But actually, there's a lot of uh, experience that's been built up. Uh, and where things are working, they should be supported and uh, protected. There may be new ways, new techniques that can be developed, but the core and the core that I've seen at the primary school needs to be maintained because that is clearly working. When, when I engage with the children at the school and see their excitement and their enthusiasm, that's really important. And therefore, I think the really important thing at the primary school that mustn't change is the fun of being educated at the primary school. Thank you. And Emily, can I just reframe it slightly for you? Because um, what would uh, your two children want to keep the same and what would they want to change? <laughs> Actually, I'm sure that I was, they would absolutely support the, uh, the idea of, of education being fun. Um, that seems to be absolutely central, um, both to the learning process, but also to their, their, their broader well-being, which is an you know, equally critical role of, the, of, the, of an education system is to um, support and provide resiliency, actually, in terms of um, broader well-being. Um, I mean, I think the other one thing I would say is we've, we've all as a society seen a major shock over the last you know, couple of months. And and that always does provide an opportunity for reflection and for, for asking exactly the questions that you have been asking are the things that need to be 
changed or are the things that really need to be kept the same and and further supported because they're doing um very good things i and perhaps going back to one of the comments that um stephen made about the importance of community uh, with the school it, it does strike me that one thing that has been you know an absolute key feature of um the circumstances that we've all had to go through over the last few months is a much greater involvement of parents and families by circumstance in their children's education and finding ways without putting in you know unnecessary burden and onus on families but finding ways of um continuing to embed that closer relationship um or families in the education system it feels to me as though that could be a really important element of of actually creating that broader community but but uh, but in, in a way also of ensuring that the education system itself provides much greater benefit than just to a single child um, it's it, you know it has a much more fundamental role in society in general and if that can be unlocked in itself by re reaching more um, deeply into families and the broader community then that surely is a good thing well thank you very much all of you for, for your time in, in these in these busy times um, if you if you actually found us on on our website unlockingresearch.org um, then thank you for for spending time listening to to us talk about um, the first book um, which is uh, unlocking research um, inspiring primary curriculum design um, there's a, it's one of six in a in a series of books um, Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor Professor Stephen Toop, uh, Senior Pro Vice Chancellor Professor Graham Virgo, and Dr. Emily Shukra, who is the um, Director of Cambridge Zero. All the information about our speakers will be below in, in the text. Um, but thank you very much again, and I wish you all a, a fantastic start to your term, which is in a few weeks' time. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.